Welcome to Vegas Circle with Pocky and Chris. And today, joining the circle, we are sitting down with the CEO of Golden Steer Steak Company and the managing partner of Golden Steer Steakhouse. We have Miss Amanda Signorelli. So welcome to the circle. Welcome, Thank you. Welcome. I'm thrilled to be here. I appreciate the invite. Yeah, it's awesome. And our, our favorite subject is restaurants, especially fine <laughs> dining. So it's an absolute pleasure to have you in the circle. Golden Steer is actually a family owned company. Yes, it's understand. actually been in my family for over 20 years now. Uh, my father oh, wow. bought it back in 2001. Oh, um, and he actually bought it pretty much like a couple months, unfortunately, right before 9 11. Oh, wow. So 9 yeah. 11 hit. And for the first almost, he said, five, six months of owning the business, there were no more than maybe 10 to 20 people every night in that restaurant because wow. nobody was coming into Vegas. Oh, so he went through a really difficult time when he first took over. And it's been yeah. in two families this entire time. There was the founding family and then mine. So it's definitely yeah. always been a family business. Yeah, that's huge because 1958? 1958. Is when it, it's unreal, man. It's probably one of the most iconic, I would probably say, steakhouses yeah. in, in Vegas. Thank you. We're proud um, to be the oldest steakhouse in Las Vegas Strip. And we yeah. are holding steady to try and get, I keep saying, like, we've made it, you know, 65 coming this next year. We got to do another unreal. 65 years after that. That's the goal. That's awesome. Yeah, it's interesting. When you have, like, an iconic steakhouse like that, and obviously when your father goes to purchase it, it seems kind of daunting, in my opinion, to be able to kind of maintain that and elevate it. It's, it's kind of hard when it's been there and established for so long. You know, what has kind of been that process to during that transition or from the feedback that you've gotten? Was it pretty great from the beginning or was it kind of hard up front? That's a great question. And it definitely had its moments of ups and downs for sure, just like any business. But I think the hardest part for myself and my husband when we took over the business is right. We were getting this mantle of like this amazing, iconic mm -hmm. restaurant with yeah, this great hard. brand. And you're like, <laughs> yep. you can't let it down. Right. I mean, yep. it's this great enterprise. Um, and for us, the thing that I think we really came to terms with was, especially for our generation, I think we have a consistent desire to kind of reimagine or evolve yeah. everything mm -hmm. yeah. and fighting against that and actually saying, no, we're not reimagining. We're not going to revolutionize yeah. the brand or experience. We're going to stick with what works. We're going to stick with the elements and really respect the history, the ambiance and the soul of the establishment rather than trying to retrofit it to today. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's really awesome. easy thing to come in and be like, hey, let's do this new kind of vibe, sure. as opposed to doing the harder thing, which is don't change it, just try and continue to expose the beauty that's already there yeah. in a way that's respectful to its essence. No, that makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. man. And you you actually have a background in tech too, right? From my understanding, yes. so you actually worked as a CEO of, was it Tech Week for yeah. a period? Wow, so you got that experience and then you come back into the family business a couple of years ago? From, from yeah, so I was or? running um, a startup company called Tech Week. We were the largest yep. community festival for tech within North America. Okay. We were in Canada, Cuba, all the amazing places. Yes. It was a blast. Yep. Uh, and then after that, I ended up running a uh, actually a rental furniture company really? with somebody okay. who I met from one of my first jobs. And he and I had a great time running mm -hmm. pretty much literally doing uh, deliveries anywhere and everywhere in Chicago. So awesome. I was a great delivery driver. <laughs> awesome, I have to awesome. admit that. Yep. Uh, and then came in and jumped into the family business when my father started getting a little bit older. And he said, hey, you know what? You're an only child. It's time to step up. Let's do yeah. this. I'm like, all right, this is terrifying, yeah. but exciting. Yeah, and yeah. I was very blessed in yeah. that uh, my husband actually, he's also a tech entrepreneur. He had oh. just sold his company, but in a former life, he was also went to culinary school and is a trained chef. Mm. So I'm like, now that uh, he can cook and I can't, we can cover it. the bases there. I really wanted to get into it because I was trying <laughs> to figure out, so you so both of you, you and your husband had that tech space. And uh, you know we gotta, we gotta mention Lisa Song Sutton, who was a friend of ours, friend of the show. Um, she mentioned you guys did some really good turns with online and during the pandemic, which we want to get into. But was that the original idea? Were, were you thinking like in the beginning that you wanted to kind of start the family business and run the family business? Or did you just kind of get the, the field of, I just want to jump in the tech world and, and it was a surprise. That wave. Yeah. I did not anticipate getting involved in the family business at all. Okay. Uh, okay. It wasn't ever something that was top of mind. I didn't expect mm -hmm. it. I had always been really passionate about tech, wanting to stay in tech. Mm -hmm. And when I got the call, I'm like, well, it's it's the golden steer. Of course, like this is what we're going to do. Sure. We're going to figure it out. And so we jumped into it. And I would love to say we had these like grand enterprises of starting the company that we have today, mm -hmm. but we didn't. We were very much focused on how do we continue the legacy of the Golden Steer? How do we continue yeah. exposing it? We're very much focused on the four walls of the business. And it wasn't until the pandemic hit that we started yeah. really expanding outside of that. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. So you guys did the pandemic hits. Obviously, all the restaurants are shut down where our strip is, you know, completely shut down, boarded up the whole nine. You end up setting up a separate company and then end up 
selling your steaks and everything online and shipping them all across the country, right? So yeah. can you talk a little bit about that? I keep thinking we've got really weird timing because I think uh, my husband, Nick, and I, we made it one year of operating the business before the pandemic hit. Oh, wow. And I'm like, so we just kind of figured wow. out how to yeah. do it. And then it was like, let's try something down. else. <laughs> so I'm like, Unreal. wow, don't yeah. follow us on timing. <laughs> so yeah. Um, we closed March 17th and immediately said, okay, there's a few options. Mm -hmm. Our big belief though was we were very confident that we felt like the pandemic was going to have longer term effects and that it was going to take a lot longer than people expected. And so we said, let's mm -hmm. imagine this is going to be a part of our world for the next five years. <clears throat> what are we going to do? What mm -hmm. does that look like? Well, the first thing first is it doesn't look like takeout for us, especially being on the strip. There weren't a ton of people that were around our immediate vicinity. We didn't even qualify with Uber Eats or Grubhub or any of those to be able to deliver Gosh. to Summerlin. Yep. So you couldn't even consider that as a path for the business. And it became a question of what do we do? Well, 80% of our customers are actually out of towners. So how do we deliver products to folks who are all over the world and think through that? Yep. So we launched our minimum viable product on Gold Belly, which was a great resource because it let us cut down our time to market by almost four months, our cost to be able to launch it by two months or probably about half. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were able to get that up and going and sent our first steak like my, I think it was like May 18th is when we shipped our first steak. So it was oh, really fast. Yeah, yeah. wow. Like two months turnaround. Let's get wow. it going and start yeah. selling. Um, yeah. And we actually sold out of our first set of inventory in two weeks after we sent one email. And that's when we knew there was that's something there. Awesome. And is that like pre-cooked yeah. steak, pre-cooked meals, or is it just- All uh, frozen. Yeah. All frozen. Oh, yeah. Wow. And to okay. be honest, the first time we shipped, we just kind of started off with, all right, let's ship the steaks. We've got the best steaks on earth. We know it's amazing. Let's do that. Let's add a couple little things, but let's just focus on that element. And then over time, we realized- you know, Golden Steer is more than steaks. Mm. It's something else. And so we said, okay, if I was going to envision what's the Golden Steer, I'd define it as amazing ambiance, fantastic mm. service, and premium food. So if each of those are the three things I want to encapsulate in a box, how do I do it? And so mm. for ambiance, the big thing, which you know, music makes everything. It does, yeah. Right? It yeah. changes the Energy, whole feeling. everything. Yeah. So we started including a Spotify playlist in every box, which has all the songs that you'd hear inside the restaurant. Oh, nice. So you smart. can get that experience. <laughs> That's awesome. Tells you how many candles to light. You got to yeah. set the mood. Yes. Make sure you're impressing everybody. Yes. Um, and then we started going to the service element, which was, okay, if you've got a great steak, you don't necessarily think about all the things you need to ask to go with it. So like, okay, let's preemptively and anticipate those needs. Think about including the seasoning, including the maitre d' butter, including the au jus, including nice. the embroidered napkins, all of the things that make it special and put it inside one box. And so then we rebuilt it out wow. to be fine dining in a box. And now we do limited edition drops. We treat them the same way. There's a limited amount that go out for every holiday. Um, there's That's cocktail awesome. mixes, everything. But it's really about how do you make fine dining in something you can ship? Yeah, it's very interesting because it's yeah, almost it's like you have the the tech mindset, which is <clears throat> forward thinking, and then you have the battle of the legacy of the longstanding business. How do you kind of navigate those two? It seems like a very important question that you're doing it. But the one thing I always have with those type of services is, you know, and being a business and you obviously you care a lot about quality with what, you know, Golden Steel represents. Like, how do you maintain that level of quality if other people are cooking it and preparing it. Maybe yeah. they don't have a great experience because they did it wrong, not necessarily something that you provided that was wrong. You yeah. hit the nail on the head. That <laughs> yeah. was the hardest part because the first round of customer inquiries we got within the first four or five months was, how do I cook this? Can yeah. you jump on and FaceTime with me? Why like, yes. can we do yep. this together? Yep. And I was like, oh, wow, we really got to figure out a way mm. to like make it accessible for them. Sure. So we started studying all of the different kind of meal delivery kits and seeing how they designed it. So we ordered from, I think in total, over 35 different companies, oh, wow. um, compiled all of their instructions and figured out who had the best format, who had the best time to complete it, who had the most kind of alternative forms, experimented with videos. So actually all of our labels had QR codes on there so that there was like a step-by-step -step wow. video to process it. Okay. Same thing with the instructions, but that was the hardest part is like, how do we make sure this is going to be great for them? But then also recognize that it's at home. So maybe you have yeah. a way that you like to cook it. Maybe mm. you feel like being salt yes. bay with your seasoning. Like yep. that's fine. Yep. Do yep. it yeah. your own. Like let's embrace yep. it. Yeah, I'm so funny. mad I didn't know about this during the pandemic. I would have <laughs> hit you guys up left and right, especially because during the pandemic, everybody was doing them. I mean, you had the verses that were popping, all these different yeah. things that people were doing from home. I could still see this continuing to go because a lot more, more people have been cooking at home. You yeah. know what I mean? So that's huge. Yeah, yeah we're super happy. That. We launched it and yeah. the second year we ended up tripling the business. So Unreal. we're just continuing to work and say like, how do we continue growing this? How do we continue yeah. expanding? So just to kind of step back a little bit, you, you mentioned that you guys had this forward thinking of this is the new norm. Yeah. You know, you hear all the time, this, unfortunately, this is the new norm, right? 
how did you know like this is <laughs> the new norm? Like, is it just something that you were, you know, you guys are just feeling the vibe or because you guys have been in business for 60 years, you can kind of tell like yeah. what these trends are. Do you guys look at trends or how did you how do you kind of keep the pulse of that? You know, I would love to say that we really had some sort of secret information, yeah, but we yeah. didn't. We were just yeah. really glued, frankly, to Twitter the entire time. Smart, um, yeah. And we were watching and we actually had an inkling and we're planning for the pandemic in December of the year prior. OK, so oh, that was yeah. the first time we heard about it was December 2019. And yes. we had actually taken steps by the end of January to be prepared. So we were very much paranoid, mm -hmm. especially <clears throat> because we had seen over 60 years, you see the ups and the downs and you see what very happens much. if you don't have plan B. Yep. And so we've always been as an establishment, very focused on like, what is plan A, B, C, D? How do we make sure this is like mitigated as possible? And so we were ready to go. Um, yeah. And we just had this belief of if it's short term, great, we can all show up the next day, a couple of weeks later and start dining and doing yep. our thing. But if it's long term and you don't have that outlook, you're in trouble. Yeah. And so we yep. said we'd rather be prepared for that worst possible scenario and just mm -hmm. be ready to go. And maybe we miss it and maybe we built something great. Maybe we don't, but mm -hmm. at least be ready. Yep. Um, and so we were just glued to Twitter the entire time, seeing the updates and seeing what we had been following and saying, you know what, we're going to make a bet. I hope it's the right one. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Yeah. I love your guys' mindset, you and Nick yeah. both, because a lot of people don't <laughs> think about that. You know, everybody were super panicking. You guys really figured out the pivot, you know what I mean, of we how to lucky. pivot in business. Yeah, that's we were awesome. Really lucky. So that's the separation from Golden Steer Steak Company. That's the online yeah. branch. And then obviously the, the brick and mortar, which is a steakhouse. Yeah, that's Got exactly it. right. Okay, awesome. I know you mentioned some of the strengths of, of being in business. Do you feel like you guys compete with a lot of the comps? Like, I don't want to mention their names on, on the show, but obviously there's a lot of steakhouses in Vegas. What do you guys think like is your biggest strengths of of being, you know, on Sahara and being, you know, a well-known name? What, what do you think that, that keeps that going? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I always laugh a little bit because I have people who come up to me all the time and they say, hey, Amanda, did you see that so-and-so restaurant's going to be opening? Are you scared? Are you nervous? Yes. And I'm yep. always like, Las Vegas is one of the toughest culinary cities to be in, period. Mm -hmm. It is incredibly difficult. Everybody yep. who somebody came in here had a concept, had some sort of rendition. Yes. Maybe it was 18 months. Maybe it was five years. Maybe it was longer. But this is a really difficult city to operate in. Yeah. And we've all proven there's plenty enough market share for everybody to continue mm -hmm. to survive, continue to thrive. What there's not enough room for yeah. is people that are ambiguous on what they're doing. If you're coming in and you're just going to be like, we're a great restaurant, that's not going to fly. Very if you come so. in and say, this is what we're about and this is what we want to bring to the table, there's space for everybody. And we've yeah. all made it through and especially over 60 plus years, there's been a lot of restaurants here. And so I always look at it as great. Just keep leveling up the city. Let's just keep becoming better at what we're doing. Can I learn from them? What can I do? I'm yeah. sure they're going to come in and do something that I need to work on. That's yeah. an opportunity for me. This yeah. is the best city to grow in. It's not one to be about yeah. challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I think about comps, I'm like, yeah, there's some great establishments out there who I love, respect, appreciate. Yeah. We're very close. We're very fortunate that as a community, you know, especially steakhouses, we all yeah. joke that we're like the carnivores in town. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's really special being here. I really yeah. do. It's kind of yeah, mentioned excellent. growth and I mean, mm -hmm. it's kind of surprising as a very successful restaurant like the Golden Steer. What has been the reason why you haven't branched off into multiple different avenues or even just like uh, not a state franchise model, but maybe five Golden Steers in Las Vegas? Is yeah. it like an integrity for one building standpoint or is it really you want to just maintain the level of um, kind of personality that that location has? Yeah, it's a really good question for us. I don't think we would ever open another Golden Steer in Las Vegas. Mm, the yeah. biggest question that we've consistently asked ourselves is, we believe the beauty of the Golden Steer is the history, the integrity, exactly as you said, of the restaurant, all of that passion and story that's in there. So wherever we go to next, we need to be able to sell whatever that story gets packaged as, which mm. cannot be in any <clears throat> way, shape or, shape or form separated from the story of Vegas. So where can you also sell a little bit of Vegas? And I don't think that's going to be next door in California. Mm, yeah. I don't think it's going to be in New York. They have their own story. But I do think it's going to be somewhere else. It's a question of what that right fit is. Yeah. Um, and that's something we're kind of experimenting. And honestly, what we're really using to start looking into it is we've had a huge growth on social media over the past year, yes, uh, yeah. especially TikTok. And so now there's a lot more data to inform us to say, OK, as we think about where this works, mm -hmm. where do we sell both of those kind of images? And what about just making it more accessible? Like I think with the you know tech side of it that we're seeing now, you're starting to, like you mentioned before, the Uber Eats and, and maybe not being able to qualify due to the location, but you're seeing satellite kitchens pop up. You're seeing yeah. to be able to expand, expand your 
area of accessibility. Have you thought about going to those different avenues just to make it more accessible for people in Vegas? Yeah, I don't think we would ever do steak in a ghost kitchen setup. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's really, really hard to do yeah. well in that format. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and especially the steak is one of those things that the moment you put it in a to-go container, that steak is going to have serious product integrity mm. problems. And that's just really hard to solve for. Where I do yeah. think there would be white space for us is like if we wanted to expand into something more like a burger concept along yeah. those lines, yeah. which I don't think in any way, shape or form we'd ever say no to. It's definitely something that would be considered on the path. Mm -hmm. But immediately we think about it as maybe there should be five golden steers in the world in those international locations. Let's uh, continue expanding that e-commerce side. And then as we grow, then continue those other pieces. But sense. Yeah. definitely, I think in an ideal world, I'd love to get some more space for the restaurant. Yeah. I would love to be able to do that. How do you compare, because you've been in you know, obviously big markets like Chicago, how do you compare like the, the Vegas food scene and culture compared to big markets like Chicago or New York or, or LA? Yeah, that's yeah. a really good question. Yeah. Every market's got its own personality, which I love. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Vegas is definitely one of the hardest to operate in though, which I don't think people necessarily realize. So the Southern Nevada Health Department for Nevada is one of the most stringent health departments in the country. So it's yes. definitely a place where you really need to have everything together and you need to be super thorough. Yeah. When you look at a market like Chicago, they've got a really, really mm -hmm. grassroots oriented that's now starting to come that next level type of community. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of concepts that are truly Chicago local bread and made, which I think is really powerful. That's mm -hmm. something that I think Vegas hasn't quite figured out yet. Because if you think yeah. about it, how many restaurants in Vegas came and were started from Vegas entrepreneurs, yes. Vegas restaurants that are not necessarily fantastic chefs who are coming into town. Mm -hmm. We're just starting to get into that. When you've yep. got Sparrow and Wolf, you've got Main Street Provisions, you've got Peyote. We're beginning to figure that out, Honey Salt, et cetera. Yeah. But for the most part, that's the biggest difference I see in Chicago and some of these other scenes is yep. it's all local chefs. It's local homegrown. It's part of that scene. And yep. Vegas is just starting to do that. Yeah, that's the one thing I'm, I'm it's, frustrating you'd be able to see is you always see the new energy in Vegas and then you'll see like it might be whatever that restaurant is in Mandela Bay or whatever it is they'll rebrand re or they'll close down and bring another new restaurant and you're like what happened to the old you're restaurant like, oh, that was 18 <laughs> yeah. months on the dock yeah, like, <laughs> like, wow, okay. yeah every time I go in I mean we, we're out this weekend and I'm looking up I'm like damn that this other restaurant's closed and now they got a new fresh new fusion whatever it is yeah but that's what I respect about you guys is 60 years and you have it running it's it's unreal it's it's amazing story thank so, you I'm glad you guys are continuing to play on that. Another question I have for you too is, what is your favorite dish on the menu? So what, what do you eat when uh, you- I'm pretty consistent. I'm okay. very yeah. consistent. So I always do, I love our garlic bread. I have okay. since I was a young child. All okay. the waiters know me from back in the day when I literally <laughs> like awesome. bring all of it home. Okay. Um, so I always do garlic bread to start. Then I like to do the toasted ravioli after that. Okay. Meatballs is my husband's favorite because our meatballs are actually made with all the trimmings from our steaks. So they're prime USDA meatballs, oh, nice. which you literally can't get anywhere that else. That is awesome. Um, and then I always go the ribeye. And I love the USDA prime ribeye. It's 22 ounces, full of fat, full of flavor. You're never going to miss it. You're never going to get it wrong. It's awesome. Freaking great. Yeah, make really me hungry. Make me, I know. I don't even <laughs> yeah. eat gas. We probably should have talked yeah. after this, set this interview up for later. Um, <laughs> the, what, what do you think you've learned as far as building a, uh, basically being in the tech world, being in the um, restaurant space, what's like the, the most adversity you think you've dealt with or the challenges you've dealt with and, and what you've learned from that? Yeah, it's been a very eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of moments where I'm like, wow, you know, as a tech person, we like to say, oh, you just do this, press yeah. a button, it'll be totally fine, it'll be automated, it'll be super easy. Yeah. And then you deal with the restaurant side and realize a lot of it still is pretty rote and manual. It needs to be done by a person, it needs to be audited, there's only so yeah. much you can do. And I think there's often a big gap between tech solutions who come in and say, oh yeah, just, you know, take a photo, put it in your phone, start filling out this information. Or when I talk to folks who have these brilliant ideas for a new inventory system, and then they're like, yeah, you just have to type out all this information. I'm like, who do you think's doing that? Yeah, My time. manager who doesn't have any time, yeah, yeah. the assistant manager who's trying to deal with staffing, the other person who's just trying to receive something. Like, where do you, where do you think that's coming from? Sure. Um, and so I think that has been a big wake up call for all of us, especially on those who went from tech into restaurant saying, okay, yeah. let's be a little bit more realistic about what resources you have, what time you have, how you approach a problem. Mm -hmm. um, even something super tactical, when we first got involved in the business, all of our checks were being done by hand, right? Oh, wow. Like basic stuff, <laughs> wow, yeah. basic stuff. 
versus going into a large enterprise who maybe already has some big software, et cetera, yeah. but they're trying to train people on how to use that every time. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be pretty clunky. And so there's just a lot of discrepancies between what is gets idealized as here's this amazing solution and great idea versus what gets executed. Mm -hmm. And that's been a big thing to really understand and appreciate. Yeah. You think it was hard for you because of the fact that you had like all these visions of how you wanted to do it. And you're like, oh, this is easy. Let's solve this problem. And you try to implement everybody's like, well, we've been doing it this way for 15 years. Why are yes. you trying to change it up? Let's talk about <laughs> sensors for a moment here. We had this brilliant idea of having, you know, IoT enabled devices on pretty much all of our equipment to be able to track things at mm -hmm. all times and then build alert systems around it. Yeah. And wow, it is really hard to actually <laughs> get done. Most of it doesn't work. So yes. you can buy all these really fancy yeah. devices but very rarely do they actually work. And my favorite part was when something breaks, as a tech person, you sit there and you're like, oh, there's gonna be like a chat function and somebody who I can talk about, they're gonna be really responsive. You don't expect to get a call and say, oh, you know, submit a support ticket and we'll call you in 48 hours. And you're like, well, I have to open, I have to be processing payments now. I don't really get to wait yeah. 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. you really do have to do everything yourself. Crazy. I love how you guys emerged. I don't know if you remember Bill Gates was talking, yeah, it's probably 30 years ago now, he was talking about high tech, high touch. Yeah. How to blend that customer service, how do you blend the tech world? And with you and Nick being able to have that tech service, knowing how you guys have ran a family business, 60 years, you guys have literally brought that marriage together of, <laughs> of restaurants in an amazing way, man. That's, that's kudos you. to you guys, that's, that's awesome. With us being a business show, uh, we always like to ask the nuggets and business advice. What's something you would recommend to somebody that maybe they might not want to make a, obviously like a steakhouse, because obviously the capital can be high, but maybe they want to open up a smaller you know, restaurant. What would you tell them of somebody that, that's scared to be able to do that or jump that hurdle? Yeah, I think this is the time in the day where mm -hmm. it's truly possible to come up with a concept and be able to achieve it quickly and efficiently and without as much capital as expected. Exactly mm -hmm. as you started going down. If yeah. I was going today, say, I'm going to just start a new concept, I'd absolutely be leveraging a ghost kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I would be very excited about the possibilities that come with TikTok. TikTok has been an amazing channel for us. We started in the pandemic and now we're 80,000 followers. Oh, wow. It's awesome. absolutely blown up. And there is no reason whatsoever that someone who's not passionate, capable, ambitious couldn't figure that out. And I'm very yeah. excited about the things that can come out of that space yeah. and truly believe that this is the time of the creator economy. And there's a lot of really great young energy out there it who is. can be smart and teach themselves. This is absolutely the space to do it. No reason they can't. And I'm yeah. so excited to see what they do create. No, it's awesome. I mean, uh, Chris and I are both in the Midwest. We absolutely love Vegas oh, because yeah. of the energy of being able to, you know, pro business here, so much going on, so much culture, so many international folks here, and, and just it's just a great energy, you yeah. know, in Vegas. And, and thanks for that advice. I'm very curious. We asked all of our guests when you're not eating at your restaurant, <laughs> I've got to know what is your go-to <laughs> restaurant That's in Vegas. That's super easy. Yeah. Okay. I love the Bizarre Meat Team, and oh, I love really? that bizarre restaurant, I and I go to that, that bar, and okay. I hang out at that bar because they're phenomenal. And I'll okay. eat that candy covered, the cotton candy foie gras, all day long. Oh, okay. wow, that sounds all good. Day long. Bizarre <laughs> Meat is actually very good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's I weird. Don't get, I don't know. It's I feel very, like it. <laughs> we've been there twice, my wife and I. It's very weird with all the hanging yeah. pigs and all this stuff. It's, it's very weird, but you're right. It is very good food. Yeah. Very good food. Phenomenal. And the team okay. is wonderful. We okay. love them. That's amazing. You'd say that being a co competitor. Yeah. That you would actually say that. <laughs> like so that's I said, good. it's the carnivore okay. community. We awesome. like to say we're always the steak table together. I love that. And I love that. <laughs> okay. Love that. What is it? Yeah. Kind candy foie gras? Yeah. Cotton yeah. candy covered yeah. foie gras. That's it's my interesting. favorite. We have never had anybody say anything about Bazaar. So that's, that's great. <laughs> what else are you guys focused on, you and Nick focused on for this year and uh, in, in coming up? Is there yeah. anything we should be looking for? Uh, you know, the big thing for us mm -hmm. is how do we continue expanding this business? How do we yep. continue the e-commerce side? Mm -hmm. We're also doing a ton of partnerships. We just did one with Dos Hombres, which was really great. Okay. Uh, and so we had Aaron Paul in, which was really cool. Oh, nice. um, and so we've just been doing a lot of these kind of other ways of saying, how do we bring the brand to life? Whether it's another partnership for a specific product, whether sure. it's starting to launch a wine club, which is something that's probably mm -hmm. going to be on our radar. And we awesome. hope to be able to ship wines as well so awesome. that we can do those kind of pairings. Um, and there's a lot of stuff we're doing on the content side too, which has been something awesome. that has been really exciting and yeah. frankly shocking. I think a lot of people see the golden steer and they're like, why would you guys be on TikTok, right? And you're like, <laughs> let me sense. tell you, it works. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the big things for us. I'm excited to see yeah, it, be able to see that, especially of delivering the steaks and the music, it just makes sense to having a wine club. You can order wine and that'd Gotta be awesome. Gotta get that pairing. See, yeah. next time yeah. we'll have to yeah. do it as a wine yeah. tasting. Maybe we should do that. That'll work, yeah. that'll yeah. work, man, <laughs> that'll work. You are very inspirational to be oh, able to see you. how you guys have been able to do everything and, and to be able to pivot the way you guys have been able to pivot shows why you guys have continued to be successful. 
and are going to be successful mm-hmm. in, in Vegas. So con- kudos to you and Nick. Where can people find you guys at, like your personal socials and obviously uh, Golden Steers, obviously TikTok and all the ones that are on there. Um, <laughs> Let's go with TikTok us? for sure. Yep, for sure. At Golden Steers State Co. I hope okay. everybody checks it out. It's wonderful. Yeah. Same awesome. thing for Instagram. We've got at Golden Steer LV and at Golden Steer State Co. And then the okay. website is GoldenSteerLasVegas.com. Awesome, yeah. Well, you're going to see us there soon. Oh, man. yeah. I hope so. Well, if I get a reservation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might have yeah. somebody to yeah, call. To, yeah. 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 Get them going, yeah. But no, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to hang out with you and, and uh, be able to learn from you. And again, you guys check them out. Golden Steer on Sahara, the awesome uh, awesome steakhouse. Uh, you can check us out at TheBiggestCircle.com and subscribe with us. So appreciate you, Amanda. Thank awesome. you. Thank you, man. Yeah. Fantastic. That was awesome, man, by the way. Thank yeah. you. That was really yeah, cool. Yeah, really insightful. Yeah.